Gerald Perry Finneman, Walter M. Jeffries, John M. Dwyer, William Ware Tice, Fred P. Phillips, Irving A. Feenberg. Normally, most of us see these roles every time we watch a TV show or a movie, and normally, we don't pay very deep attention to them. For instance, who really remembers the cinematographer or the set designers for Big Bang Theory? But with Star Trek, these backstage roles came with their own celebrity. In the making of Star Trek, they showed us every member of the Star Trek production crew as well as their contributions. As a result, almost everyone who watched this video would have known all those names. But there was one man who made extraordinary contributions to Star Trek in the early years. But in what is truly a shocking turn of events, his identity was deliberately hidden for more than a decade. Join us after the break as we take a look at the amazing life of Wa Ming Chang and his various creations. Be sure to check out these other popular videos about Season 1 on our series covering Star Trek in the 1960s. Also, please be sure to hit the like button below this video so that YouTube will recommend this video to more folks that have not had the opportunity to see it yet. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mr. Wa Ming Chang. This one craftsman was responsible for some of the most iconic props, prosthetics, and effects ever created for Star Trek. His creations included, but by no means were limited to, the Romulan Bird of Prey, the White Rabbit from Shore Leave, the Gorn from Arena, Balok from the Corbinite Maneuver, the Salt Vampire from the Mantrap, and even the world-famous Tribbles. But we're only beginning to tell this man's amazing story. So at this point, let's take a little step back in time. Wa Chang's first involvement with Star Trek goes all the way back to the pre-production of the first pilot during the last few months of 1964. Bob Justman had just finished up working on The Outer Limits when he became involved with Desilu's pilot for a proposed TV series named Star Trek. Not long after the production started, he reached out to Projects Unlimited, a company that created numerous Monsters of the Week for the TV show the Outer Limits. Now, one of his first tasks was to create a new type of laser pistol, as well as a handheld communication device. Now, everything that surrounded the Star Trek production at this time was done on a shoestring budget. Every penny had to be saved for possible budget overruns in later episodes, and trust me, they always occurred. So, the pistol would show up in three more episodes after the first pilot. Of course, it would show up in Where No Man Has Gone Before, it also showed up, as you can see here, in The Man Trap, and finally, in What Are Little Girls Made Of? Now, one final thing before we move on. It also seems that our little laser pistol has an uncertain pedigree. It has always been assumed that Hua Chang made these pistols. After all, he made the other handheld props for the cage, as well as most of the creature effects. But no actual documentation has ever been discovered to substantiate this. In fact, the only book to attribute this work in print to Hua Chang was The Art of Star Trek. Now, similarly, there's a story floating around the internet that Hua Chang had completely disavowed building the lasers. But those stories also have no evidence to point back to. So at the end of the day, it really, to me at least, seems far more likely that Chang had actually built these parts, rather than Desilu hiring yet another company to make them. And we know that the Desilu Prop Studio did not make them, because they would later be used for creating the phasers that replaced the laser pistol. So at the end of the day, there's no proof one way or the other, since everyone who was even tangentially involved in the production, has long since passed on. And trust me, the internet is full of angry Trexperts arguing their thoughts on this subject. Now, in addition to props, they had Hua Chang provide several aliens in the pilot, starting, of course, with the Telosians themselves. They also ended up using two other creature costumes that had been previously created for The Outer Limits. 
Reusing these costumes in television was a commonplace occurrence at those times. In fact, the bird creature that you see above with Jeffrey Hunter right now was used at least in four different series that I know of. First in The Outer Limits, second in Star Trek, third in Lost in Space, and fourth in Bewitched. So after the pilots were done and Desi Lu was faced with beginning the TV series, they used their own in-house property shop to build the very first phasers, which were designed by Matt Jeffries. At a total cost of $7,000, yes, ladies and gentlemen, that would be $64,000 today, Roddenberry felt the phasers looked far too much like toys, and very poor quality toys at that. There is no way he would rely on these to be used for close-up shots. The white handles made a poor color choice for the grips of the phasers, and the surface of the phasers were very plain, with no visible details on the phaser. The entire design screamed plastic toy. So Gene sent the phasers to Chang and asked him to modify them to make them more functional and attractive. To assist with this, they sent sketches and notes from Matt Jeffries. Most of the remaining white-handled phasers would be repainted during the first season and used in scenes where the heroes wouldn't be needed. The white handles can only be seen in the episodes The Man Trap, The Enemy Within, and The Naked Time. Originally, it was believed they had all been repainted over the years, but quite a few of them have shown up in the private collector's market, indicating that they may have actually been replaced rather than repainted. For many years, decades even, it was believed that only a single hero phaser existed. But in 2021, fandom was shocked again when another hero phaser went up for auction. Now, where did this phaser come from, you ask? Well, it appears that Desilu had sent one of the Type 2 hero bodies over to Chang for repair at some point in the second season. At some point in the very late 60s, he gave it to someone, or sold it, it's not really clear at this moment, at the same time, one of the crew members who worked on Star Trek had kept a Type 1 phaser after filming it in a second season episode. Years later, the two owners would be introduced and decided to combine the two pieces into a fully intact hero phaser. After careful analysis between the phaser and the only Type 2 hero phaser ever known to exist, it was established, as you can see in these pictures, that it was authentic, and even the Type 1 phasers were interchangeable between the two. When they dismantled this thing, they discovered it was virtually identical to the other hero. It ended up selling in an auction during June of 2021 for a total of $250,000, including buyer's premium. Two of Chang's most famous creations are the original tricorder and communicator, both seen here in vintage contemporary photos. He made a total of 10 communicators, two heroes, and eight others that the cast could use when they didn't have to be close to a camera. In what would turn out to be a tremendous help in authenticating communicators over the following decades, each of the ten would have specific characteristics to aid in authentication, as you can see here in the photo. In addition to the communicators, he produced two hero models of the tricorder and modified the hero models of the phaser. Now, it was at this point in time that Bob Justman, shown here on the left, encountered his very first pushback by the studio as a result of him using Chang to build the props. It seemed that the local union had gotten word that Justman had used Chang to make the props. They raised a complaint with the studio because Chang did not belong to their union. Now, this surprised Justman, to say the least, because he had been using Chang and his company to make props and creature effects for three years on The Outer Limits, and no one had ever brought this up before. Nor did anybody bring it up when they filmed the two pilots. Desi Liu's labor relations department suggested to Justman that Hua Chang join the union, and then he could design and build everything that Desi Liu needed. But things took a very strange turn that no one saw coming. Even though he had previously won an Academy Award, the union refused to accept his application. They told Justman that Chang's skill level was too high and that he would make their other artists look poor in comparison. Uh, sure, yeah. Oh, and don't worry, I'll get that Academy Award in a minute. Okay, so Justman came up with the story that they weren't actually paying Chang to design and build things. Instead, 
They claimed that he had already made these props, and that they had seen them and liked them when they visited his, quote, store, unquote, which was actually a work shed in his backyard. This also meant that Chang would never be formally credited on screen for his work on Star Trek. In fact, it would take about a decade of conventions before people started asking about, what was the deal that you heard about the guy that created the phaser communicator and track order? Chang, shown in the middle panel here, also designed and built the Vulcan Lyra, which was featured in three episodes. The lower right corner shows his wife holding it. It was made of solid wood and actually only had a single string that was wrapped around many times to get the illusions of multiple strings. As such, the original was not capable of playing any notes and was a non-functional prop. Years later, it would show up on all things on Mork and Mindy, although it had been painted completely black by them. After that, it had disappeared yet again until Doug Drexler found it, apparently in some Paramount sound stages while making Star Trek DS9. Unfortunately, it once again vanished not long after that. Now, oddly enough, there are quite a few stories of Next Generation staffers finding original Trek props and such in various closets and storage areas, only to have them magically disappear afterwards. Now, these are two behind-the-scenes photos showing the space buoy from the Corbomite maneuver that he did, and one of the Neanderthal-style creatures that attacked the Galileo 7. And of course, as most of my viewers will know here, the next big thing that Wa Chang did was create the Romulan Bird of Prey for the episode Balance of Terror. However, in addition to the studio model, he also designed the Romulan Centurion helmet and their ears as well. However, right about this time, the Union caught wind of the fact that Desi Lu had still been working with Chang. Their lawyers showed up at Desi Lu with receipts showing all the work that had been given to Chang, and they demanded that Desi Lu stop payment on every payment that was still outstanding for Chang. They told Desi Lu they would sue unless they agreed to withhold this money from Chang. Now, you can see here a couple of shots of the model being filmed at the Anderson Studios. The filming completed, and since Desi Lu had not actually yet paid for the model, it went back with Chang until it would be needed again. Maybe even Desilu had asked for changes, but no matter what the reason, it is a fact that would have far-reaching consequences. Soon afterwards, Chang was told that Desilu would not be paying him what they owed him, not to mention that he would no longer be used by the studio. The same union that wouldn't allow him to join had now effectively stopped his career in television. Well, as he explained in an NPR interview in 1982, he went into his backyard where his workshop was, and in a fit of anger, he smashed the studio model to pieces with a sledgehammer. So the infamous result was that when Desilu needed to film the Romulan ship again, uh, they had to use the Klingon studio model instead. Now here's a little bit of American history to put this in other events that we're about to talk about in perspective for you. Racist labor laws were a fixture of the American legal system for a long time. Beginning with the Exclusion Act, first implemented in 1882, which prohibited immigration of Chinese laborers. The American Federation of Labor lobbied Congress in 1902 to reauthorize the act, and they did. And it was not repealed until 1943. Now, the long and short of this is that it can't really be said with absolute certainty that the Prop Makers Union rejected Chang because of his Chinese ancestry. We do know with absolute certainty that he faced prejudice throughout his entire life and fought a constant battle for recognition and that even his interracial marriage was out and out illegal in California at the time. I'm sorry, if it walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Now, over the years, Wa Chang's Star Trek work has become almost legendary with many people attributing things to him that were actually done by others. Like here, for instance, is a March 2022 article on the Cracked.com website that said that Chang created the phaser, even though it was always well known that Matt Jeffries created the phaser. If this video was going to be solely about Chang's Star Trek work, we'd be pretty much done at this point. But we're going to give you a little bit more detailed glance at Wa Chang and show you some things that will truly surprise and impress you about this magnificent artist. Others here on YouTube have spoken about his work on Star Trek. Others yet may discuss his work on Outer Limits. 
and maybe even some other science fiction TV shows he had worked in. But no one has ever taken you through the life of this amazing man who experienced discrimination at every point in his life, or the two major health crises that culminated with polio and the loss of the ability to walk, or of his phenomenal resume, beginning with Walt Disney, an Academy Award, children's television, and an amazing body of sculpted artwork that still command premium prices even today. Ladies and gentlemen, I once again present you Master Wa Ming Chang. Wa had a highly developed talent in art by a very early age. By the time he was nine years old, he had already been featured in several newspaper stories because of his surprising talent. In the clip that you see here, they are announcing that James Blanding Sloan, a very popular artist and set designer, would be showing a gallery that featured etchings done by Wa. Sloan would go on to form tight ties with the child, and when Wah's mother dies unexpectedly, Sloan and his wife agree to take the child in until he has finished school. Sadly enough, even with all of his notoriety in the newspapers, he had already faced discrimination when he was simply too young to understand. At age 13, he had arranged to take a dancing class, and after only a few classes, they met him at the door one day and asked him never to come back. The reason? Apparently, several of the parents had become furious with the dance studio when they discovered their daughters had been dancing with a Chinaman. While still a young boy, Wa was placed in a sanatorium during the massive wave of tuberculosis that ravaged the country. He stayed there about a year. Now, ironically, he later said that it turned out he didn't really have the disease at all, but he had been considered a high risk. So they quarantined him anyway, which today we know was actually the worst possible thing they could have done with a disease that was as contagious as that. So after getting out of the sanatorium, Wa graduates from school and eventually finds his way to Los Angeles, working as one of the early pioneers of stop-motion cinematography. Word spread fast, too, and at age 21, he became the youngest artist ever to be hired by Walt Disney himself. While at Disney, he sculptured figures of the main characters so that animators could use them as references for their drawings. Here, you see a photo of the Pinocchio puppet, as well as a sculpt for a deer in Bambi. Before he left Disney, he would work on Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi. And oddly enough, he wouldn't be listed in the credits of any of those movies. There's no clear reason documented anywhere as to why Walt didn't give him credit for his work. But there is a possible clue. The Exclusion Act, which prohibited immigration of Chinese laborers, was not repealed until four years after Bambi was released. So while he wasn't actually an immigrant, you can definitely see the real reason they may not have wanted to list him. Now here's a treat for you. In 2015, Disney employees discovered this rare color photo showing the animators using the final puppet as a drawing reference. This is only one of six color photographs that are known to exist from the Walt Disney Corporation at this time frame. And now we have to touch on another major milestone in Wa's life, as he was diagnosed with polio while still working for Disney. After taking a summer vacation, he returned to work, but he felt really, really ill. Within a few days, he found himself in the hospital. Now, at this point, there was no cure or treatment for polio. In fact, even today, there is no cure for that disease. We beat polio by ensuring vaccinations for everyone. To this very day, children are given four doses of that vaccine before they hit the age of six. He quickly found himself unable to walk and then was set yet again to another sanatorium. He ended up staying there about a year, just learning to walk and move around again. At the beginning of this confinement, Walt found out what had happened and wrote Wah this letter. While he later recovered, the dreaded disease left permanent damage to his body. Indeed, for the rest of his life, he did not have the lung strength to actually blow up a balloon. Right up to his very last years, he suffered from long polio effects. I want to take us on a quick side trip to introduce you to Glenella Taylor. She and Wah met while he was working in the Texas Cavalcade with Blanding Sloan. Their relationship continued for several years, and after his recovery from polio, the couple made the decision that now was the time to get married. But once again, 
Well, I ran into discrimination. In the state of California, it was actually illegal for a Caucasian and a Chinese person to marry. So ironically, the couple goes into Texas in order to be married. Unfortunately, because of the race issues, Glenn's parents refused to come to the wedding. They strongly disliked the fact that their daughter had married outside of her race. In time, as the years would go by, they fully accepted Wa, and he would later say that even in the worst of times with her parents, they always treated him nicely. The marriage turned out to be a perfect fit, as Wa and Glenn would work together professionally on many different projects going forward. Not long afterwards, Wa was hired by George Powell to work in the Puppetoon series, and it was there that he met Gene Warren. Now, to really set the stage here, you need to understand that Powell was the 1950s version of Steven Spielberg. He had previously introduced the timeless classics that are still revered today, Destination Moon in 1950, When Worlds Collide in 1951, War of the Worlds in 1953, and Conquest of Space in 1955. Now, by the 1950s, Wa and Jean had started a company called Projects Unlimited, and together they would produce costumes, stop-motion movies, and other special effects for clients. Wa and his company were hired to do the special effects for the George Powell blockbuster, The Time Machine. Wa designed the actual prop that you can see here. The movie was extraordinary, and Projects Unlimited won an Oscar for the special effects. For the very first time in his career, we can actually see his name in the credits. But yet again, strange events would conspire to obscure this credit for the rest of his life. During the Academy Awards, when they announced the winners, they called off every name from Projects Unlimited that had been involved, except Wa. And his name was also left off the statuette. After the ceremony was over, Gene had gone straight up to the Academy and wanted to know why wasn't Wah's name on the Oscar or even mentioned in the presentation. Everybody else was. The official response was, Wah was left out due to the way in which the credits were submitted to the Academy. Oh yeah, sure. I'm sure that's what it was. The next movie he worked on was the 1963 blockbuster Cleopatra. Among other things, he designed the extravagant costume and headdress for Elizabeth Taylor. Although, once again, he was not acknowledged in the credits. After a successful run in the movies, Project Unlimited's next client was ABC TV's new anthology series, The Outer Limits. For the entire three-year period that The Outer Limits would air, Chang's Project Unlimited provided creature designs as well as the associated studio shots and performances. While working on the show, he would meet Bob Justman, who would continue on to Star Trek and would be responsible for engaging Chang on that series. For two years and 49 episodes, no one from any of the local unions had ever objected to Justman over using Wa as non-union artists. Which kind of explains how shocked Justman was when they complained about Chang and refused to allow him to join their union. In the 1970s, Chang was hired to create the various stop-motion dinosaurs for the Saturday morning TV show, Land of the Lost. Once again, as they had done with his run in The Outer Limits, the local union folks left him alone and didn't try to get him taken off the project. Ironically, it was probably due to them thinking of it as being a kiddie show, and therefore there'd be no prestige tied to the work done for that show. So Wa would get his very last screen credit on his last project. The last major commercial project did was creating the Pillsbury Doughboy, as seen in this vintage early 1970s clip. Not long after, Chang turned to sculpting as his final passion, and he continued to do so right up to his death, having become a quite well-known name in the collecting world. Until this very day, no one has ever been able to explain why Hua Chang experienced so much difficulty in getting credit for his work over the years. Hindsight is always 2020, they say, and I think in this case, the hindsight's pretty clear. With 50 credits listed at IMDb, around half of them were uncredited, including such high-profile projects as Planet of the Apes and The King and I. 
Hua Ming Chang passed in 2003, about six years after he lost his beloved wife. At the end of his life, he had given multiple interviews on his career, and the thing that was most impressive for me to see when reviewing them was that he never once in his entire life complained about his lot in life. He remained positive and clearly was happy with the things that he had done in his life, and he never needed others' recognition for his work to know that the work was great. After all, the work speaks for itself. Please be sure to check out other fascinating videos that we have on our Trek World channel. You see a few of them right here. And also, please, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button down below so that YouTube will recommend it to more new viewers. Until next time, live long and prosper.